Hello and a very warm welcome to all of you listening. I hope that you're all doing well. You join me today in our continuing journey through the book of Daniel. Our reading for today is taken from chapter number 5 and I'll be reading verses 13 to 21. So this is Daniel chapter 5 verses 13 to 21. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation. But they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you, that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king, and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory and honour. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up and whomever he wished he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men, his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and appoints over it whomever he chooses. This is the word of the Lord. Before we begin our examination of today's passage, let us briefly review what we looked at last time. We find ourselves now in chapter number 5, The chapter marks, as we noted before, a historic transition in the book. The long reign of King Nebuchadnezzar ended in the year 562 BC. There was then a period of political uncertainty in which several monarchs came and went in a relatively short space of time. This instability ended with the crowning of King Nabonidus in the year 556 BC. He ruled alone for three years before promoting his son Belshazzar to be co-regent in the year 553 BC. These two men would be joint kings upon the downfall of Neo-Babylon, which occurred in the year 539 BC. The events detailed in the opening part of chapter 5 take place in the city of Babylon. It is, as we've just noted, the year 539 BC. For reasons that are unknown, King Nabonidus is absent from the scene. King Belshazzar is the one in charge, as the forces of the Medo-Persians surround the city. Perhaps due to a false sense of security, afforded by the mighty walls of the city, Belshazzar seems unconcerned. He is so unconcerned, in fact, that he regards this as being an opportune moment to throw a wild party. And when I say wild... I mean wild. The Greek historian Xenophon writes about the banquet. He records that there were ostriches pulling around trays of fruits, nuts and other delicacies. All of the elite of Babylon society are invited, and a debaucherous party ensues. At some point during this party, the king calls for the holy vessels that were taken from the temple in Jerusalem to be brought out. These were the gold and silver temple treasures that were taken by King Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar desires to use these consecrated items to mock God and toast the worthless gods that he served. It is as this act of sacrilege plays out 
that a mysterious supernatural hand appears and writes a message on the plaster wall. The king, and no doubt all who witness this supernatural event, are quite naturally terrified. Daniel gives us the wonderful detail that the king's hips were loosened and his knees knocked together. He gyrated like Elvis in his heyday. The king is unable to read or understand the message, and so he calls on his wise and learned men. But they too are unable to make any sense of this message. This sends the king into an even greater state of worry and concern. And it's at this point in the story that the queen, or more likely the queen mother, appears on the scene. She had wisely stayed away from the drunken party. We spent a little time last week discussing who exactly she might be. It is possible that she was the wife of Nabonidus, meaning that she was Belshazzar's mother. Alternatively, she may have been one of Nebuchadnezzar's surviving wives, possibly even the mother of Nabonidus, meaning that she was Belshazzar's grandmother. Whoever she was, she was someone that was admired and respected, a person, probably due to their age and status, to whom the king felt obliged to listen. The queen, or the queen mother, has some good advice for the king. She remembers back to the time of Nebuchadnezzar's first dream. She recalls how the king had been helped on that occasion by a Jewish exile named Daniel. Her recollection is vivid. She remembers how this Daniel was possessed by the Holy Spirit. And as a result of this, he was full of light, wisdom and understanding. King Nebuchadnezzar had recognised his value and worth and promoted him to be the president or the leader over all the wise men of Babylon. She urges the king to call on this man to help solve the mysterious writing on the wall. What will the king decide to do? Well, that will be the subject of our sermon today. Over the next couple of weeks, we will see Daniel unravel a mystery. As I told you last time, the Queen tells Belshazzar that Daniel is skilled in unravelling knots. Not the kind we encounter in string or rope, but the intellectual puzzles or conundrums that we encounter from time to time. God had given Daniel the gift of unpicking these kinds of puzzles. So let's begin today by spending a little time talking about word puzzles, codes or ciphers. Since ancient times, politicians, military leaders and even lovers have used ciphers or word codes to encrypt confidential messages. The word that we use to describe the use of such things is cryptography. As a child, I remember having a little code book and my sister and I often send messages to each other using special codes from the book. Perhaps you did the same thing. The reason for using codes and ciphers has largely remained the same over the centuries. Simply stated, it is to communicate messages in such a way that enemies cannot read or understand them. So, with that little intro complete, let's find out what happens to Daniel the Code Breaker. Verses 13 and 14 Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. As we have established, King Belshazzar was a fool. He parted at an inopportune time, and he stupidly called for and participated in an act of sacrilege involving God's consecrated temple vessels. However, he was not so foolish as to ignore the wise counsel of the old queen or queen mother. Her words gave him pause. Maybe he should call Daniel and see what he had to say. I suppose from a practical viewpoint, we could say that he had little to lose. He couldn't solve the riddle himself. His wise and learned men were equally clueless. So why not let Daniel try? He would either provide an interpretation or fail as the others had. So Daniel is brought in before the king. 
I've alluded a little to Daniel's age before. Warren Wearsby, in his commentary, makes the case that Daniel was 16 years old when he was taken to Babylon in the year 605 BC. It's now 539 BC, meaning that as he entered that royal banquet hall, Daniel was 82 years of age. The king's words here are interesting. The queen, as we've seen, had told him a number of things about Daniel. However, she had not mentioned that he was a Jewish exile. Neither had she said that he was one of the young men brought to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. Now I suppose we could argue that the fact that he has a Hebrew name is a big clue to his origin. But possibly it means that the king is not completely ignorant of Daniel. We should also note that an ancient king would not want to publicly acknowledge their ignorance or of someone or something. They would not want to be shamed into having to confess to an area of ignorance or weakness. So maybe he has heard of him by name and what he did in the past, his reputation before. Or maybe he's just bluffing. As John Trapp writes in his commentary, This silly and shallow prince have nothing to say but was put what was put into his mouth by his wiser grandmother. Perhaps all he really knows is what the Queen Mother has told him. Let's, however, give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that he has heard of Daniel's name and of his reputation. He affirms here what seems to be widely known and accepted, that Daniel has extraordinary ability that comes from a divine source. Listen again to the words that he uses. That the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. What a wonderful description that is of Daniel. And that should be our goal too. We should desire that people say that about us. Remember the message given to us by our Lord and Saviour that forms part of the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 to 16 we read, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. How brightly does your light shine? Are you like a lighthouse standing at the top of a rocky outcrop, does the light of Christ project from you like a mighty beam penetrating into the darkness? Or are you more like a flickering candle? Well, let's see what the king has to say next. Verse 15. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation. But they could not give the interpretation of the thing. What a telling admission by the king. Now we must assume that in a mighty city like Babylon, the education system must have been very good. We are often guilty of what C.S. Lewis termed chronological snobbery. We look back into history and think that the people back then were inferior in terms of intellect to us today. This is simply not the case. Actually, IQ scores have been declining since the year 1975, According to an article in the New Scientist magazine, the decline is around 7 to 10 points per decade. So when it comes to ancient Babylon, we can be quite sure that the best and brightest would have been encouraged and given opportunities to excel. There would have been schools or universities in which men could be educated and trained. We know that Daniel and his friends were given a first-rate education in this system. And yet here the king confesses that his wise men have fallen short. They are unable to interpret this mysterious message. The king is absolutely correct here, but not for the reasons that he thinks. He believes that understanding this puzzle is a little bit like the letter codes that I gave you at the beginning of this sermon. They are easy enough to solve once you know where, what the letters or numbers represent. But that is not what's going on here. The real reason that the Babylonian wise men cannot solve the riddle 
is that they are applying worldly, human wisdom to a spiritual problem. The things of God are never going to be plain or clear if the lenses that you are, are looking through are smeared with the thoughts and ideas of this world. As I'm sure that you are all aware, there is a massive difference between the wisdom of this world and God's wisdom. Let me give you just one example to highlight what I mean. What does worldly wisdom say about prayer? It says that it is a largely pointless exercise. Now, sceptics may concede that prayer may provide some modest psychological benefits. They may admit that on a personal level, you may feel better unburdening yourself. You may also take some comfort or relief from placing your fears or worries upon someone else. But the big worldly picture is that you are basically wasting your time. Why bother speaking to a fictitious being in the sky? So from a worldly perspective, prayer is a worthless thing to do. God's wisdom, though, tells us something entirely different. Prayer is an immensely valuable gift that God has given to us. It allows us 24-7 communication with the sovereign God of the universe. God created prayer, and he knows its value. That's why God calls upon us all to pray without ceasing. God desires that we come to him at all times and bring our needs, wants, hopes and fears to him. Furthermore, we know that prayer is efficacious. Prayer works. History is full of examples of God answering prayer. So the world is welcome to its wisdom on prayer. But it's wrong, and I'll ignore it. Well, let us continue. Verse 16. And I have heard of you, that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. We are left to guess whether the king really did have this knowledge or whether he is just echoing the queen mother's words. Whatever the case, he is willing to give Daniel an opportunity to interpret the message. He again restates the promise previously given to the other wise men. If they can give him an interpretation, they will be richly rewarded. They shall be clothed in purple, meaning that they will be given a place of power and prestige. They shall have a gold chain hung around their neck, again signifying power. In the ancient world, only the rich and powerful got to wear gold jewellery. Finally, they will be made third ruler in the land. As we noted before, Belshazzar was co-regent with his father Nabonidus. So the prize on offer here is to be third in terms of leadership behind the two kings. That's quite an incentive. And it's noteworthy for three reasons. Firstly, that the king is willing to offer this reward to a Jew, a foreigner. Now, he could have chosen to handsomely reward Daniel, but not to the same degree that he would a Chaldean. But he does not do this. Secondly, it shows us that he believes that everybody has a price. He believes that, as many do today, that given the right reward, people can be incentivized to do anything. Thirdly and finally, it underscores Belshazzar's desperation. The level of reward offered could not be any higher. The king is willing to offer this massive prize because he truly desires to know the meaning of this message. The reward on offer then is great. No doubt Daniel is licking his lips at the prospect of obtaining all of that bounty. Well, let's read on and see exactly how he will react. Verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king, and make known to him the interpretation. Oh, I absolutely love this verse. It's one of my favourite moments in the whole Bible. I just wish I could have been there to see Daniel deliver it. Oh, how I'd love to have seen Belshazzar's face. 
Daniel, as we've noted, was an old man at this point, and yet here he shows great fearlessness. It demonstrates to us the complete confidence that he must have had in God. He knew that God was able to protect him, so he was not afraid to speak directly, and or harshly, we should say, to the king. He tells the king in no uncertain terms that he doesn't want the gifts. You can keep them, he says, or give them to someone else. In saying this, he is also informing the king that he is not interested in being promoted to be third in line. These material war rewards are of no interest to Daniel. Now, some might consider Daniel's words here to be a sign of loyalty, or even of devotion to the king. That what Daniel is saying is that he is so happy to serve the king that he does not want or need these rewards. But I don't think that's what is happening. Why then is Daniel rejecting these material rewards, potentially offending the king and risking his wrath? After all, some of you may remember that in chapter 2 he had accepted the gifts offered by King Nebuchadnezzar. But this, we must remember, was a long time ago, and the context was very different. Daniel at that time probably intended to use Nebuchadnezzar's gifts to benefit the fellow Jews around him. So what exactly is going on here? Well, there are a number of possible reasons as to why Daniel spurned the king's generous offer. Firstly, Daniel knew what was about to happen. King Belshazzar had only a matter of hours left to live. Therefore, it was pointless taking any rewards from a king whose empire was moments from collapse. Secondly, Daniel did not want people to think that he could be brought or bribed for money or gifts. He had a well-deserved reputation of being a devoted and loyal man of God. This meant that he knew that the gifts that God had given him were for God's glory, not for his own personal gain. So maintaining his own and God's good name was important to him. He didn't want his God-given spiritual gifts to be connected with material or worldly things. Thirdly, I think that Daniel is deliberately stepping back from the king and allowing there to be separation between them. He doesn't want to be connected to or obligated to the king in any way. Belshazzar was guilty of openly mocking God. Daniel knows that God is angry with the king and wants to reflect that in his attitude towards the monarch. In taking this cold or distant stance, Daniel again displayed great, great courage and nerve. As we've seen on many occasions, ancient kings were not well known for their patience and even tempers. As we shall shortly see, this courage and nerve extended to the point where he was direct enough to call out Belshazzar's arrogance and stupidity in failing to learn from the lessons of his father, Nebuchadnezzar. Finally, in this verse, Daniel demonstrates great trust and faith in God. He has no doubt that God will provide him with the meaning of the message and allow him to give the king an interpretation. Well, let us read on. Verses 18 and 19. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty, glory and honour. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. In order for Daniel's interpretation to make sense, he has to put things into context. The same principle applies today. We cannot, for example, talk about Israel's relations with its immediate neighbours without putting things into historical context. So here Daniel will begin by talking about what happened in the past to King Nebuchadnezzar. This is designed to set up Daniel's scathing criticism of Belshazzar as an unrepentant, profane, arrogant man who failed to learn from the past. He begins by briefly recounting the history of Neo-Babylon's greatest monarch, King Nebuchadnezzar. We, of course, are very familiar with his story, as we have just studied chapter number four. Perhaps Belshazzar was not so familiar with the story, 
though he really ought to have been. This was, after all, his grandfather. It was not exactly distant past, but human beings do have a tendency to quickly forget about past events. I am sure that you have heard the famous saying attributed to the philosopher George Santayana, Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. How true this is. It was also probably the case that Belshazzar was an arrogant and prideful man. No doubt he thought that he had nothing to learn from his dead ancestors. This was, as we shall soon see, a very great mistake. Had he studied and learned from Nebuchadnezzar's experiences, how different things might have been. Daniel reminds the king how magnificent the empire had been under Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's fame was known far and wide. His glory was unprecedented. As we have seen in previous sermons, he beautified Babylon and his royal palace. It was said to be the most beautiful building ever constructed. He also launched many building projects and commanded a powerful army. No one could doubt the authority that he wielded over all of his subjects. Daniel tells us that he ruled as an absolute monarch. He was not tired or hamstrung by laws and decrees. As a result, people both respected and feared him. He exercised absolute control over the life and death of his subjects. If you pleased him, you could expect to be rewarded. He would lift up or promote those he favoured. If you angered or annoyed him, you could expect a swift journey to the oven. Nebuchadnezzar then had ruled his empire in great majesty and splendour. But please note, this is of supreme importance. He had power, majesty and might only because God allowed it. He owed his greatness, glory and majesty to God. This was something that the king was very slow to recognise or acknowledge. Well, let us read on. Verse number 20. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. We have spoken at length about the nature and character of King Nebuchadnezzar. He was the archetypal despotic ruler. He ruled as he wished and could not be reasoned with. He considered himself to be a god and to have a godlike status. No one was permitted to challenge or criticise him. He was then, to put it plainly, an incredibly arrogant and prideful man. Daniel tells us here that his spirit was hardened by pride. We might replace the word spirit here with heart. The meaning is the same. At his very core, Nebuchadnezzar rejected God and put himself at the centre. He was the God of his own life. For this act of stubborn and selfish pride, God punished him. God would use this humbling act to forever curb the king of his arrogance and pride. He was removed from his throne and his majesty and glory were taken from him. Well, let us continue. Verse 21. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and appoints over it whomever he chooses. As we saw when we examined what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, we know that he became mad. He may well have suffered from a condition known as boanthropy, a mental aberration in which the sufferer believes themselves to be a cow. In this state, the king was driven from people to live in the wild places. His very heart, the essence of who he was, became beast-like. He lived with the wild donkeys. It was, as we have noted, a terrible fall from grace. From the majesty and splendour of being king of an empire, living in an ornate palace, to being a beast crawling around in the mud for seven long years. 
So over these past two verses, Daniel has recalled the progressive steps of Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation. Firstly, he was deposed from the throne. Secondly, his glory was taken away. Thirdly, he was driven away from society. Fourthly, he lost his mind or became mad. And fifthly, he lived and ate outdoors just like the animals. What a fool it was. But God, as we saw, had a reason and purpose for all of this. God had a plan, a plan that ultimately involved restoration. All of these things were designed to bring Nebuchadnezzar to a realisation of his proper place in the universe. It was intended to give him perspective. That's something that we all need from time from time. He was not the all-powerful and dominant figure that he thought he was. The world did not really revolve around him. It was the Most High God, Yahweh, who rules over all things. He's the one around whom the world revolves. It is God, not man, who ultimately decides how things will go here on earth. This is something that we should all remember, living as we do in this era of fear and uncertainty. Does global climate change represent an existential emergency? Will food production be so affected that we will all be reduced to eating bugs? Will the conflict in the Middle East spiral out of control and end in World War III? Will China invade Taiwan? Will we witness another global pandemic? All of these things rest in God's mighty hands. And if they are part of God's plan, then they all will occur. If not, he will stay the hands of those who push for them to take place. As believers, all that we can really do is pray and place our trust in God. To take comfort in the fact that he can only ever do what is best and right. So the example of Nebuchadnezzar should have given Belshazzar a sobering life lesson. He really should have learned from the experiences of his grandfather. But as we shall discover next week, this arrogant and foolish man had not taken heed. Lessons to learn. I have two comments to make based on today's passage. Number one, what is our motivation? Motivation is defined as that which moves one toward an action, that which changes, provokes or impels our very being. There are a number of things that motivate us to do or not to do things. In general, though, we are motivated to maximise pleasure and minimise pain. We do things that benefit us or give us happiness, and tend not to do things that have the opposite effect. The Bible, as you probably will be, not be surprised to hear, has a great deal to say about motivation. The motivation of Christians is different from that of unbelievers. This, I hope, is obvious. The world is motivated by self and of the promotion of oneself. The world's motivation is encapsulated in the expression, it's all about me. This leads, if unchecked, to self-determination, self-obsession and self-worship. Christians, though, should be different. As believers, our sense of motivation or inspiration comes from God, not from the things of this world. We saw this today in Daniel's reaction to King Belshazzar. From a worldly perspective, what the king was offering was amazing. It was literally life-transforming. To be materially rewarded and made to be third ruler of a vast empire. Just imagine the power, honour and prestige that such a position offered. But Daniel was unimpressed. He was unmotivated by these rewards. He was motivated by serving and honouring God. He rejected the rewards because he was aware of how accepting these gifts would look to observers. They would assume that God's gifts were something that could be bought or sold. We too have to be careful about how our acts today might be misconstrued. We don't want people to think that we are motivated by all of the wrong reasons. We don't want people to think that we are motivated by the fleshly things that occupy the minds of unbelievers. 
we should strive to be like Daniel, or better yet, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. He set the example for our motivation in this life. In John chapter 4 verse 34 we read, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to finish his work. Jesus then was concerned with pleasing his Father. That was his motivation. We should be motivated by that same concern. The Lord Jesus always did the Father's will, motivated by pleasing him through obedience. May our motivation be the same. Number two, the importance of speaking the truth. Daniel, as we saw in today's passage, showed great courage and boldness. He spoke bluntly to a king who held the power of life and death over him. Daniel would not be swayed or distracted from the powerful truth that he had to impart. The king was in grave error. He needed to hear the truth even though doing so would offend and upset him. This same principle has not changed in all the centuries that separate us from Daniel. The same expectation rests upon us. Today, unfortunately, especially in the West, we are surrounded by the notion of not causing offence. We are to endeavour to be nice, accommodating, accepting and generous to all. Now, as followers of Christ, we should not want to be unpleasant or unkind people. If we are mean or sour-looking people, we hardly serve as good advertisements for the faith. Who would want to come to a church full of unsmiling grumblers and moaners? No one. However, we are in possession of the truth, and we should not be afraid to share that truth with others. Truth has the potential to hurt, but this should not deter us from sharing it. The Pope made headlines a couple of weeks ago by basically saying that all religions are paths to God. Now on the outside, it might seem like a warm and embracing thing to say. Let's not divide or fight over how we acknowledge, worship or approach God. After all, the end result is the same. No, this is not the truth. Just one Bible verse smashes this illusion. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So it's not loving or kind to share an untruth. It's especially harmful to share an untruth related to our eternal salvation. It's actually very dangerous. How many Muslims, Buddhists, Sikhs heard the Pope's words and now think that they are on their way to heaven. His lies may result in many being damned for all eternity. So we must learn from the example of Daniel. We must be prepared to share the truth, no matter the personal risk to ourselves. Rest assured that when we speak the truth that God is with us, may we then all boldly and clearly speak the truth at all times. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, 
so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled, his countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke. O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now, let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now, the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you, that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines, have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand 
and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written. Mini, mini, tikal you farsen. This is the interpretation of each word. Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tikal, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple, and put a chain of gold around his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about sixty-two years old.